بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified We thank him We thank him this day for all that he has done for us to have brought you safely to Trinidad and we pray to him for protection that this retreat might continue to its conclusion successfully we pray that there might be benefit for all of you from this retreat and that your faith might increase insha'Allah and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and our father Adam and our father Abraham and Moses and Jesus and on his mother the Blessed Virgin Mary and on the last of them all the Blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam and we pray for mercy and for blessings on the soul of our dear teacher our dear teacher Maulana Dr. Muhammad Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah May Allah have mercy on his soul forgive him his sins and build for him a house in Jannah Ameen before we begin our first session on signs of the last day and the reality of the modern world permit me to take a brief moment to enter into the record there are many amongst our men folk our brothers who worked very hard to organize this retreat but I'm not going to mention their names it is our sisters who worked equally hard there are parts of the world today the Muslim world where women are not allowed in the masjid where women are excluded put away put behind a wall but in this retreat they worked very hard I want to mention the name of Hafsa Hafsa who's been writing to you all all the time she's not here she's at work oh she's here Oh, she's there. I want to mention the name of Zoraida, who did all of this. Muslim sister. And this is recorded for posterity. I want to mention the name of Salima. You should find them, these women, who worked so hard, who slept, I think, two hours last night of Dr. Mumida Shah who is somewhere around of Mehrul Rahman who has worked hardest of all but if this retreat is taking place today it's because Karima Karima Rashid 
is responsible for it. I have been getting requests from many parts of the world, from those who wanted to come to Trinidad to study with me. I said, I, I'm sorry, we don't have the arrangement, but Karima didn't ask permission to come. She came and she brought with her a group from San Francisco. This was last March and they spent a week. It was a wonderful week. And it was as a result of that one week that this was born. So meet Karima when you have the time and thank her. For because of her, we have this retreat. And start putting aside your money and putting aside your time. Because we want to meet again next year. It's going to be a much bigger retreat than this one. And if you're from Cape Town, your heart will be beating faster now. Because we want to meet in Cape Town. Excuse me, beautiful Cape Town. One year from now. Maybe just after Eid al-Adha next year. That's going to be much bigger, inshallah. Another retreat. This one is small. And this one is deliberately small. For reasons you will learn in time. And so may Allah bless them, our sisters, those whose names have, I have not mentioned, who work so hard. They say, we, we discriminate against our women. Today, we put our women first. But there's one more whose name has been mentioned. Before she came into my life, I had written only one book on Islam and Buddhism. And after she came into my life, all these books are coming out. My beloved wife Aisha. I've said to her, I won't change you for a thousand <laughs> red camels. So when you meet her, you could probably tell her there are very few red camels in the world now. May Allah bless her. My wife Aisha. It was the last stage of the life of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. He had performed a pilgrimage and at the end of the pilgrimage he gave the sermon and he asked the people, have I delivered the message? Do you bear witness? And then revelation came down announcing this day, the job is complete. This day, I have perfected for you your religion. I've completed my favor unto you. And I've ordained for you Islam. Islam meaning submission, not to the state. Submission. To he who created you from a drop of sperm. That's Islam. And so we thought, that's the end. And then the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, returned to Medina. And then there was one more revelation. And tomorrow, and on Monday, we're going to spend some time on that, which explains why is it that wealth no, no longer circulates through the world? Why is it that the rich are now permanently rich, and the rich are ruling the world? And why is it that the poor are now imprisoned in permanent poverty and constantly growing poorer? 
That revelation explains it. But there was something else that happened during those last days of the life of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And that's the story we want to tell. It's not a fiction, it's an actual event. So relax as we tell you what happened that day. For in this event there is the key to the understanding, to the recognition of the reality of the world today. No one can explain the reality of the world today. None can do it the way Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam can do it. This is a very important man. He never went to school. He never went to university. He could not read. He could not write. No. And yet, from him came not only the blessed Quran which was revealed to him, but from him came that which explains the political reality of the world today, the emerging political dictatorship, that which explains the economic reality of the world today, the rule of the rich and the impoverishment of the masses and the imprisonment in permanent poverty. And so listen to what happened to Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam on that day. He was sitting in the masjid with us, with his companions, when a stranger entered. He was dressed all in white, his hair was black. No one knew him. And so in Medina, if no one knew you, you had to be a foreigner, someone who had come from outside. But there were no Toyota Camrys, air conditioned automatic. You had to travel through the desert by camel. And when you arrived in Medina, you'd have dust all over you, dust in your eyebrows, dust in your ears, dust on your face, dust in your beards. But this man did not have a speck of dust upon him. So who is he? No one knew him. He could not have been a resident of this city because no one knew him. And yet he could not have been a traveler from outside because there was no evidence of travel on him. So did he drop out of the sky? This is drama. The divine wisdom is at work to ensure that this event remains unforgettable, that you will never forget it. There is wisdom at work here, and this morning we have to take our time, that it can soak in, because this is the foundation <laughs> of all that is to come for the rest of this retreat. You may have read of it before, but today you're going to think about it, ponder and reflect. And that's why I'm speaking so slowly, so slowly. Why, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing this? 
after having said the job is done, the religion is perfected, why does he send this stranger with so much drama, so much mystery, so mystifying, so puzzling, so baffling, so unforgettable? The stranger enters, he walks through the gathering, and he comes and sits in front of the Prophet. Allah's blessings be upon him. Sits so close that his knees are touching the knees of the Prophet. And this is an inexcusable breach of security. For if he had a dagger, usually from Guantanamo, he could pull it out. And no one is there to intervene, to protect the Prophet. So why were we as though stuck to our seats? No one could move. No one moved. The mystery is intensifying. The drama is intensifying. And then he began to question the Prophet. Allah's blessings be upon him. And when the Prophet would answer, he would say, as though he is a village schoolmaster, your answer is correct. Oh, but wait a minute. We're not accustomed to this. We would only ask a question when we do not know the answer. But he knows the answers. And he is questioning Allah's messenger. And he is not questioning him about how to bake fish. No. He asks him five questions. And they pertain to the heart of our subject. The reality of the world today. But before we proceed to the questions and to the answers, I want to take you to my teacher, Mawlana Fadl Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah. He taught me a valuable lesson of the pursuit of knowledge. And many, many years later, I could learn the same lesson from the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, and you are familiar with it, and He did it at the very beginning of the Quran, that He ordered the angels to bow down, to prostrate before our father Adam. Fasajadu, and they all prostrated. Illa Iblis, except Iblis, Satan. The wording of this phrase, which is repeated several times in the Quran, makes it clear, crystal clear, that if we take this verse by itself, independently as a stand alone verse statement if he ordered the angels to bow down and they all bow down except Iblis the implication is that Iblis is an angel can't get away from that irrefutable logic Iblis or Satan is an angel. That is, if we use this methodology, this inadequate methodology, this defective methodology of studying the verse 
in isolation, a standalone. But if we discard that methodology, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us a lesson in methodology of the pursuit of knowledge. If you discard that defective, inadequate methodology and you turn to another methodology, that you must go to this, the totality of the subject and take the whole of the subject to try to understand that which binds it together as a whole, a harmonious, integrated whole. And then you come to this verse. Then, oh no, not at all. He was not an angel. He was a jinn. In this book, an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world, I know you've not seen it as yet, you've only seen it on the internet. I know that. And we didn't get a shipment to Trinidad in time. But those who came from Cape Town and those who came from Singapore, they brought some copies with them in their suitcases. And I had a little parcel that came to me by courier yesterday. So we do have a few copies. You can look at it during the retreat, but you can't buy it. Only at the end of the retreat, we'll put whatever we have of this on sale. But in this book, there's a chapter on methodology, which explains what I'm speaking about now. And so what we do is we take all the five questions and try to understand them in their totality as a whole and not isolate them and study them as standalone questions. No, that's the methodology we're going to use now. Question number one. What is Islam? And the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, replies that Islam is that you should believe that there is no God but the one God, Allah, the God of Abraham. And that you should believe in the other four pillars, fasting and the pilgrimage and salat or prayer and the zakat. And then he answered and he said, your answer is correct. And then he asked, what is faith? Amen. And the Prophet replied and said that faith or Iman is that you must have faith in Allah and in the angels. They don't teach about this in the university anymore. And in the angels and in the scriptures and in the prophets and in the last day, in judgment, in good and evil. And he said, your answer is correct. And then he asked a third question. He asked, what is Al-Ihsan? And the Prophet replied and he said, And ta'abud Allah ka'annaka tarah. That you should worship Allah. As though you're seeing him. As though you're seeing him. For if you cannot see him, for innahu yalak, surely he is seeing you. But wait a minute. Remember when Musa, Musa would be Moses, Musa alayhi salam. Remember when he went up the mountain, Mount Sinai, not the hospital in Manhattan, Mount Sinai. 
Did he not say, Arini anzur ilaik, show me yourself, I want to see you. That's love. If you have love in your heart, you'd want to see the one you love. So show me yourself, I want to see you. And did Allah not reply and say, Lantarani? Nope, not possible. Not possible. You can't see me, Musa, alayhi salam. No. You can't put God in a temple. You can't put him in a house. You can't see him. Not with these eyes. Not possible. Lantarani. But then, did the companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, did he, did they not ask him, O Messenger of Allah, would we see Allah on the last day? That's their question. And guess what he answered? You'd be surprised. He asked them rhetorically, do you have any difficulty seeing the sun? When it is noon time, they said, no. He said, that's how you will see your Lord on Judgment Day. Remember, he's talking about those who believe in Allah, not those who are ruling the world from Washington and imposing their bloody dictatorship upon the masses around the world. And then he asked again rhetorically, Do you have any difficulty in seeing the moon when it is full moon? It's going to be full moon Sunday night, eh? They said, no. He said, that's how you will see your Lord on Judgment Day. The Quran is saying you can't see Allah. The Prophet is saying you will see Allah. You see him the way you see the sun and the moon. How do we resolve this apparent conflict? Perhaps when he said that we will see him, he meant that you would see him, but not with these eyes. Oh. Do we have any other eyes besides these eyes? I want you to save that question with you, to take it back to Belgium, and to take it back to Ghana, and to take it back to Cape Town. Do we have any other eyes besides these eyes? The University of the West Indies says, no, these are the only eyes we have. And this is the only avenue we have for the pursuit of knowledge, external observation and rational inquiry which combines with external observation. So they say, no, these are the only eyes we have. There are no other eyes. But the Quran says yes, and the Bible says the same thing. And if I had the time to go through the Vedas, I'd probably find it in the Vedas as well. But in addition to these eyes, we have internal sight, that the heart can see, and the heart can hear. And the heart can acquire knowledge. And so, that you should worship Allah as though you're seeing Him. With the eye 
of the heart. And so what the questioner has done is to take us through different stages of the religious way of life. The stage of belief, the stage of faith, and then the internalization of faith to such an extent that the heart can see. When the electricity goes, then don't you have to feel for the matches, to light the matches? Without light you can't see. As it is with the external eye, so it is with the internal eye. It is only when there is light in the heart that it can see. But that light is not sold in the stock market. No. Allah guides to his light. Whomsoever Allah wishes to guide. And if Allah puts light in the heart, then your PhD can be used usefully. But if there is no light in the heart, then Allah says of such people, they have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. They have hearts, but they do not understand. They're just like cattle. What do you mean? Even with a PhD from MIT? Yes, you're just like cattle. If you do not have light in the heart, indicating that there is going to come a time, there will come a time in the historical process when none will be able to understand the reality unless you're able to penetrate reality not only with these eyes but with these eyes and you can't fool Allah no if with your lips you worship him but with your heart you worship the two gardens you know what I'm talking about with the river running in between. You know what I'm talking about. And the land is fertile. You know what I'm talking about. Don't look at me like that. Surah Kahf. And the rich man and the poor man. If with your lips you say you worship him. But with your heart you worship the dunya. Then there will be no light in the heart. And at the end of the day, you will wring your hands and say, Ya laytani lam ushrik bi rabbi ahada. Oh, unto me that I ever committed this act of blasphemy. To worship with the lips and to worship with the heart, something else. And if you cannot see me, then at least you could begin the process by recognizing that I am seeing you. فَإِلَّمْ تَكُنْ تَرَى فَإِنَّهُ يَرَى And so these were three questions that were preliminary to the fourth and the fifth. And these three were not by accident. They were not haphazard. They were integrally linked, organically linked with number four and number five. We have to search for this system of meaning which binds together the five. 
Question number four. When will the last hour come? Oh, oh, I see. Allah has caused this event to occur to teach us something about the last hour and about the methodology for the study of the subject of the last hour. And the Prophet replied, and he said, the one who is being questioned has no more knowledge of the subject than the one who is doing the questioning. So next question, please. Which is a very, a very nice answer. Indicating he knows who he is. He knows how much he knows. <laughs> And he does not want to disclose anything more than what he's given in this answer. And then came question five, which is at the heart of this retreat. And I want to confess to you that I am still myself learning from this last question and its answer. He asked, what are the signs of the last hour? And the Prophet replied and said that you will find the naked, barefooted shepherds competing in the construction of grand buildings. You'll see them as you drive around. <laughs> grand tall structures indicating that you have to be blind not to recognize the last age when it comes because yesterday there were no tall buildings but now they're going up all over the world and each one wants to build a tall building than the other one. So if you can't see and recognize that sign, well, you're just eating halwa or halawa. <laughs> it's time to wake up. When the tall buildings keep on going up around the world, that's the sign that you're living in a different age. You living in a last stage of history. And the methodology for the study of the world today is different from that which preceded this age. And it is time for Islamic scholarship to wake up to that lesson. And those who are building the tall buildings, look at the language with which they are described. They are not men of wisdom. They are not sages. They are not true leaders. They are not people who can be measured with a yardstick, a measuring rod. And they measure tall. No. These who are putting up these big PR projects, tall buildings, they measure progress on the basis of the height of the building. They do not measure progress on the basis of integrity or character of faith or the beauty of personality. Now, these are the people who will engage in squandomania, frittering, frittering away the resources in these grand projects rather than having these resources be used for the benefit of the masses.
what I'm saying here, you'll hear it in our parliament. Every day they're saying it in parliament now, right now as I'm speaking. Uh, usually the opposition. And so, naked, barefooted shepherds would compete in the construction of high-rise buildings. That's the first sign. And that's the easy sign. You got to be blind not to recognize it when it comes. Let me repeat that. This is the easy sign. Easily recognizable, easy identifiable. You got to be blind not to see it. That the naked, barefooted shepherds, people with the intellectual acumen of donkeys, would now control resources in this monstrously immoral way. <laughs> monstrously immoral way. Squandering resources in the construction of high-rise buildings, PR projects, measuring progress, the height of the building, rather than using resources for the benefit of the people, the masses the intellectual acumen of donkeys. And now comes the second sign, and this is the difficult one. He gave us one which was easy, and he gave us the other one. You've got to put on your thinking cap for this one. And tell it al amatu Oh, you have heard it so many times. That the slave woman will give birth to her mistress, not her master, her mistress. That a slave woman would give birth to her mistress. I tell you, this is not an easy one. You will hear many explanations of this. And even when the attempt is superficial, still we commend those who try to make an effort. And we remember yesterday when we also were very superficial in our understanding. And we thank Allah who gives us the understanding that otherwise we would not have. We will come to the slave woman in this retreat. We spend a lot of time with her. But at this stage, let us recognize from the word of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, that there is slavery at the end of history. That there may be slavery behind us. And we may have been emancipated from that slavery. And we may beat the drums out there on emancipation day. But remember, the greatest slavery of all is the one that is still ahead of us. No one will believe us when we say this. Who are these Muslims? Where do they get their knowledge from? What nonsense is this? In this modern age, he's talking about slavery. In this modern age, he has the audacity to say, that the greatest slavery of all is the one that lies ahead of us. Where do these Muslims get their knowledge from? We get it from Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, who could neither read and could not write. These were the five questions. 
And in these five questions is the foundation of our retreat. And then the man got up and left as unceremoniously as he had arrived. Who is this man? He's not a resident of this city. Nobody knows him. He could not have been a traveler from abroad, from outside, because there is no evidence of travel on him. So did he drop out of the sky? There is drama. There is mystery. It is puzzling. It is baffling. The divine wisdom is at work. And this morning we have to pause. Don't rush. Think. What? is Allah doing? What message is he sending? In this last stage of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, when the stranger had left, then the Prophet turned to us and asked, Do you know who he was? And so we replied, Allah and his messenger know best. Oh, we don't know. And then the prophet said, that was Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, Jibra'il alayhi salam. And he came to teach you your religion. If Allah had already completed his revelation and taught us the religion then what does this mean he came to teach you your religion my understanding and Allah knows best is that what the prophet is saying when he said he came to teach you your religion is that in these five questions and in the answers which were given and in the drama which attended the event you will find the very heart of the religious guidance the very heart of the message of the religion and you'll also find the key to understanding the greatest challenge that there will ever be in history to the religious way of life. That challenge has now come. It has come from one part of the world. It has not come from Africa. No. Beautiful Africa, which today has been reduced to miserable poverty. Miserable poverty and destitution. Why? Because Africa is not made of recycled paper. Why? Because Africa has packed bone made of steel. That's why Africa is now in miserable poverty. Because Africa produced a Malcolm X. There's never been, there has never been the equal of a Malcolm in the entire Western Hemisphere. In all through history, there has never been the equal of a Malcolm X. He never went to Al Azhar University. No. He couldn't speak Arabic. No. But Malcolm had a backbone made of steel. 
And Bantukam was not afraid to stand up to the slave master. And if Malcolm were alive today, he would look to the White House and say, there's another house slave. And that's why Africa today is in miserable poverty. Around the world today, from the study of these five questions and the answers given, we can not only recognize but also understand what's going on in the world. This is the importance of the subject of signs of the last day. And the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to send the angel at the end of the life of the Prophet when he had just a few days left to live, about 80 days left, 81 days. The reason why he sent angel Gabriel alayhi salam at this last stage of the life of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam because herein in this event is the key to the understanding of the last age. Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam spoke profusely giving many many more signs the slave woman of course we're gonna to have to come back to her why does she have to give birth to her mistress why not a master and how can a slave woman give birth to one who is going to rule over her it's going to tickle your intellect in this retreat but for those who seem to be blind and cannot see and continue to preach Islam with a message we've heard again and again and again and again so that now we are, excuse me, we are yawning. Oh, we've heard it already. But refuse, they refuse, they refuse to touch this subject. We ask them, did he not say that when the last age comes, women would be dressed and yet be naked? Did you not hear that? When last have you gone to a shopping mall? Hmm? Is that not here now? Women are dressed and yet naked? When the world is moving in that direction, you see which way I'm pointing. Women are dressed and yet naked. Tell me, what kind of intellectual acumen do you have that you insist that we must remain a part of mainstream society? Huh? No. If that's the direction in which they are moving, we're going to move in the opposite direction. He said that women would dress like men. When last have you gone to the bank? Do you see them how they are now required to dress? There was a woman who was working in the Hilton Hotel in Port of Spain in Trinidad a couple of years ago. The manager, I believe, is a Muslim. But uh, we're not concerned with him now. But Hilton Hotel decided that these are our rules. That you have as a woman 
to come to work dressed with a jacket and with trousers or with a tie. And she refused. She said, no, I don't want to dress like that. I'm a woman. I'm not comfortable with that. Do you have any problems with my work? No, no, no. You're a very good worker. We're proud of you. But unless you're prepared to abide by our dress code, we can't have you. It would be it would be bad for the image of the Hilton Hotel for a woman to appear dressed like a woman. <laughs> yes. And so, when you see the world moving in that direction, that women are now tailoring their clothing to conform, with a mainstream ethic which says that you must dress like a man with trousers, with a jacket, and a tie. When they're moving in that direction, what kind of intellectual acumen do you have if you also move with the mainstream? We say, when they are moving in that direction, we must move in this direction. So that our woman would truly and enchantingly be woman. He said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, about the last age. That men... Uh, don't be annoyed with me. Don't be annoyed with me. I'm just quoting what the Prophet said. He said that men would dress like women. That was women being dressed, women dressing like men. This is men dressing like women. Now I invite you, go on the internet and check out photographs of U.S. presidents from number one. Was it George Washington, number one? George Washington, yeah. Check out the photographs of presidents of the United States of America. And as you go through them one by one, one by one, one by one, suddenly you will ask yourself, where did the barber come from? Because, hey, the beard is going. Every president had a beard. But look at the photographs. They all had beards. Every president of the United States had a beard. And if at that time there was a man without a beard, well, let me explain, teach you a local expression now. So you'll take this back with you. And a child were to see a man without a beard, the child will say to his mother, Mama, look a boo boo day. <laughs> Mama, look, look a boo boo day. A man without a beard. Well, why? has modern Western civilization chosen to remove the bed. And uh, we, of course, are simply following them, sometimes without knowledge. And I hope I'm not offending anyone. I have a job to do. Let me do it. The answer is that a man cannot dress as a woman and yet have a beard. But after the beard has been taken off, sometimes, wow, that's a good looking woman, eh? Really, that's a good looking woman. No, no, it's not a woman, it's a man. <laughs> 
is it happening in the world today? These are signs easily identifiable which should strike us, our hearts and our intellect into recognizing the reality of the world today. And when once we recognize these signs, that this is the age that Prophet Muhammad warned about, then the sensible thing to do is to now apply yourself to the study of the world today, its reality, and that's what we want to do in this retreat. I have spoken slowly. I've taken my time because this is the foundation of the retreat. Well, if this is the world today, what is the world tomorrow going to be like? Someone can probably now put on the new poster. Islam and the end of history. Do we know where the world is going to? Do we have any understanding of what's the end to which we are moving? If we recognize this to be the last age, It is the function of spirituality to be able to deliver knowledge which otherwise cannot be accessed. A man had to sign a document but he didn't have any light with which to see. So the spiritual master said, no problem, and he raised his finger. And the finger began to glow. And he says, no, there you are, you've got the light now, you can sign. Is that spirituality? A man was seen in a town in Trinidad at the time of the pilgrimage. And when the people came back from Mecca, they said, we saw him in Mecca. But how could he be in Mecca when he was here in Trinidad at the time of the pilgrimage? Can you be in two places at the same time? Is that the essence of spirituality? What is spirituality? A man has been blessed with the capacity to heal. And so people come to him knocking at his door day and night. Can you do something for me? I'm suffering from this illness or that illness. And he prays and he blows and you're healed. Spiritual healing. Is that the essence of spirituality? No. These are the offshoots. What is the essence of spirituality? It is the capacity to see what otherwise cannot be seen. In the Quran there are verses with multiple meanings. The Quran says in Surah Al Nahal, Surah number 16, the B, Ba'adawuz billahi min al Shaitan al Rajim, wa nazzalna alayk al kitab al tibiyan al likul shay, wa hudan wa rahmatan wa bushra lil muslimin. And we sent down the book, the Qur'an, 
sent it down on thee, O Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon you, that this Quran might be tibiyanan li kulli shay, that this Quran might explain all things. And therefore, that this Quran might not only explain yesterday, and not only explain today, but that this Quran might explain tomorrow. But in order that that explanation of tomorrow, which is in the Quran, can be accessed, you need, number one, to have nur, to be able to see with the internal eye. And number two, you got to do your homework. You got to study the subject as a whole, and that subject as a whole is not confined to the Quran. It also includes external world out there. You have to study that changing world out there. And tonight, it's going to be a long day today. And tonight in the masjid, when we take up Surah al kahf and the passage that Sheikh Mustafa recited, and you of course are going to read from your folders, the the translation and commentary. Allah says that you would find the most learned of all men, the one who has the capacity to understand the world in the age of Dajjal, the false messiah. Because Surah al kahf of the Quran is the only, only, only part of the Quran linked to Dajjal. You would find the most learned of all men, the one with the capacity to penetrate the Quran as it explains tomorrow. You will find him at Majma'ul Bahrain. Majma'ul Bahrain. What's that? You'll find him at the place where the two oceans meet. So in Cape Town, they took me for a drive up the Table Mountains. And they pointed out to me, they said, this, this is where the two oceans meet. <laughs> well, Imam Baydawi, rahimahullah, explains, as no one else has ever explained. He said, the two oceans, the place where the two oceans meet, where you'll find the most learned of all men. He said, these two oceans are the ocean of knowledge externally acquired. So you got to observe, as Malcolm X used to acutely observe the external world. The ocean of knowledge externally acquired. So you should be studying what's happening in the world of money. Why is the US dollar collapsing at this time? You should be studying monetary economics. The ocean of knowledge externally acquired and the ocean of knowledge internally bestowed. When these two oceans of knowledge come together and are harmoniously integrated, only then do you have the scholar with the capacity to penetrate what the Quran has to say about tomorrow. It was our good fortune that we were students of such a scholar. Yes, there are unfortunately 
even here in Trinidad, those who look down <laughs> upon him, and we feel sorry for them. They do not recognize the greatness of that teacher. When the two oceans of knowledge, the one externally acquired, the one internally acquired, come together, and you use the methodology that I mentioned in ch chapter 3 of this book, now we can go to the Quran so that the Quran can explain to us the world today. In this session, we're only going to give you a taste of what is to come. We'll quote just a few verses of the Quran so that the Quran can begin the process of explaining tomorrow. This strange age, this last age, where are we going? What is the end? What is the culmination? In Surah Al-Ma'idah, Surah number 5 of the Quran, the verse is around 49 or 50. And you'll find that verse in this book, oh, it looks like Jerusalem in the Quran, doesn't it? <laughs> I only got it last night. And it's much bigger than the normal Jerusalem in the Quran. Because the Malay language, they take two pages to say what you could say in English in one page. This is the Malay translation from Malaysia and Indonesia, Singapore. In this book, you'll find that verse. In this book, an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world, you'll also find that verse. Where Allah gives a command. Listen to the command. And now I can speed up a little bit. بَعْلَ أُوذِ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O you who have faith in Allah لَا تَتَّخِذُ الْيَهُودَ وَالنَّصَارَ أَوْلِيَاءَ Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your awliya. Now remember, we have discarded that deficient and defective methodology, eh? the one where you take a verse in isolation, stand alone, to derive meaning. We, we've thrown that out of the window. Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your awliya, your friends and allies. Ba'aduhum awliya uba. When we look at the translations of the Quran, all the translations of the Quran say the same thing. They are friends and allies of each other. So using those translations, let us proceed. Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. They are friends and allies of each other. And whosoever turns to them with friendship and alliance, you now belong to them. You no longer belong to us. In Allah la yahdil And Allah condemns it. This is an act of hulum, wickedness. And Allah will not provide guidance for people who commit such an act of wickedness. What? Taking Jews and Christians as your friends and allies? Is that what the verse is saying? But a Muslim man is allowed to marry a Christian woman. Isn't it? Except of course in Malaysia. <laughs> so, if, if we use this translation, then he'll have to say to his wife, let me teach you another expression now, Trinidadian expression. You can, you can call your wife, Dudu. So he'll have to say, Dudu, 
You can be my wife, but you can't be my friend. Huh? Did you hear that? Dudu, the Quran says that you can be my wife, but you cannot be my friend. Kind of strange, eh? Is this what the Quran is saying? Come on. Will you accept that translation? That standalone, defective, deficient translation? No. That's not what the Quran is saying. Well, then, what is the Quran saying? Do not take Jews and Christians as your friends and allies. They are friends and allies of each other. That is false. Jews and Christians were never friends and allies of each other. That is false. Can the Quran be speaking of falsehood? Oh, the Quran is not saying that. But unless you study the Quran to understand it tomorrow, while standing at Majma'ul Bahrain, the place where the two oceans meet, you will not be able to recognize what the Quran is saying about tomorrow. What the Quran is saying is do not take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other. The Quran is anticipating a time which is to come. It tomorrow when there will be a mysterious reconciliation with part of the Christian world, not all, and part of the Jewish world, not all, who are going to reconcile with each other. And a Jewish-Christian alliance will emerge in the world. When that mysterious alliance is established in the world, then watch it. Watch those Jews and those Christians, not all. When that alliance emerges, a Jewish-Christian alliance, then you are prohibited from becoming their friends and allies. You do you think the government of Egypt would be comfortable with this verse of the Quran? Or the Saudi government? Or those who are ruling Pakistan from Islamabad? That Jewish Christian alliance has emerged. That Jewish Christian alliance has emerged in Europe. It is a European phenomenon, a uniquely European phenomenon. Europe was Christian, it was Christendom. Europe discriminated against the Jews. But a new Europe has emerged. <laughs> in which Christians and Jews have now reconciled with each other. And if you didn't know it, let me tell you, the United States of America is a Judeo-Christian country. Muslims may just be tolerated, but you don't have the status that they have. It is a Judeo-Christian country. When the Jewish-Christian alliance emerges, as it has emerged in Europe, and you are prohibited from becoming their friends and allies, 
Then Allah declares, if you disobey this command and you join them and become their friends and allies, you now belong to them. You no longer belong to us. So, we need a new theology for the last age. We cannot remain with the old theology of how do we define a Muslim. Who is a Muslim and who is not a Muslim? We studied this subject as students. This is Kalam, Islamic theology. And large volumes have been written on this subject. But when the last age comes, you need a new theology with which to determine who is a Muslim and who is not. Because Allah says, وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ And whosoever from amongst you turns to them, as nearly all the governments have done, you no longer belong to us, you now belong to them. Saudi Arabia is a client state of the Jewish Christian Alliance which today rules the world. They no longer belong to us, they now belong to them. So wake up and recognize the reality of the world in which you are living. This pivotally important verse of the Quran Pivotally important verse of the Quran. For understanding the reality of the world today. When you study it from the books of Tafsir, you will not find the meaning of the verse as it explains tomorrow. I want to turn now to yet another verse of the Quran which tells us about tomorrow. This is the last age. We want to know where is the last age taking us. In Surah Al-Anbiya, Surah number 21 of the Quran, the Prophets, there is a Remarkable verse. I have a dear student, a sheikh from Africa, from Niger, who did his PhD in Islamic studies and who probably is weeping, weeping today. Sheikh Saleh Idrisa. Ibrahim, and when the recording of this lecture reaches him, he'd probably weep even more. Because for the last two months, he'd been trying to attend this retreat. And today he's not here. He has his ticket paid for. But today he's not here. Because he did not get a visa as yet to come. Having fulfilled all the requirements for a visa, a man with a PhD, a sheikh from Africa, and could not be here in the Caribbean to attend today's address, today's program. But Sheikh Saleh has studied this verse with me. We have jointly worked on this ayah. Every single tafsir we studied. What is the verse? Allah speaks Ba'adahu Billah in the Shaitan Rajeem. And he says He speaks about a town. Qariya. A town. And he says that he destroyed that town. And having destroyed the town he placed a ban 
that they could never return to the town to reclaim it as their own, the people of the town. No. They could never return to this town to reclaim it. Hatta until he's speaking now of tomorrow until a time comes when one of the major signs of the last day appears. What is it? The companions were sitting talking amongst themselves. When he, the Prophet والسلام, came and asked, What are you talking about? And they said, We're talking about the signs of the last day. And he said, The last day would not come until. And he mentioned ten signs. You know them, don't you? The fingertips. Number one. And these are not given in the chronological order in which they will occur. Number one, Dajjal, the false messiah, the antichrist. Number two, Gog and Magog, who are in the Bible. Gog and Magog, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Number three, the return of the son of Mary. The return of the son of Mary. Number four, Dukhan, smoke. Number five, the battle of a creature of the earth. Number six, that the sun would rise even in Barakpur from the west. Number seven, eight, and nine. Three khusuf, plural of khas. Khas is a sinking of the earth, therefore an earthquake. An earthquake, a sinking of the earth. And the earth sinks down and swallows what it swallows. Hmm? One in the east, one in the west, and the third one in Arabia. And number ten, that a fire will come out of Yemen. I tell you, the Saudis don't like number ten at all. <laughs> that a fire will come out of Yemen and would drive people to their place of assembly, Judgment Day, perhaps. So these are the ten major signs. And of these ten, there is one, Gog and Magog. This book was just written on this subject. An Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world, and there are many who are very uncomfortable with this book. <laughs> because it has given a different understanding and explanation of the subject from that to which they are traditionally accustomed. And so Allah speaks about a town which he destroyed. And the people were expelled. And then he placed a ban that they could never return to reclaim that town as their own. Hatta iza futihat ya'juj wa ma'juj wa hum min kulli halabin yansirun until Gog and Magog are released. Allah releases them, not the Security Council of the UN. Allah releases them until Gog and Magog are released. And when they are released, Nassel, Nassel, they procreate, they expand in all directions. Another interpretation, they descend from every height. Both, both are important. Only when these two things happen, 
when Gog and Magog are released into the world. And these are human beings from Banu Adam, human beings. But these are human beings who have been endowed by the Creator with an indestructible power. Power. I have created, this is in Sahih Muslim, I have created creatures of mine so powerful that none but I can destroy them. And so when they are released into the world, the world will experience something unique. Something never experienced before on the stage of history. A people are going to emerge who will sweep aside everything. Every civilization will be swept aside. And with their indestructible power, they're going to take control of the world. And having taken control of the world, they're going to spread all around the world procreating themselves. In other words, one global society is going to emerge and it will be a global society of people who will, listen to the word, replicate, replicate the way of life of Gog and Magog. You know the phrase I've coined to describe that global society, don't you? I call it a blue jeans, Jamat. One way of life will take over the world. Which town is this? Which is the key to the understanding of tomorrow? The key to the understanding of the end of history? The last age is taking us somewhere. We want to know where it is. Which town is this? When we study the books of Tafsir, the answer is not there. It could not have been there. No one could have answered it. Because events had not as yet unfolded in the world. Remember, that ocean of knowledge and this ocean of knowledge must come together. Is there anything in the data which has come from Prophet Muhammad by which we could identify that town? We go now to all the ahadith on Gog and Magog to see whether any town has been mentioned that is connected with them. And when we study all the ahadith, all the statements, all the data, which has come from the Prophet Islam on Gog and Magog, we find only one town mentioned. Only one. And it is Jerusalem. And so, we are not placing our feet on shifting sand when we identify the town as Jerusalem because we use a methodology which begins by looking at the ahadith yes Jerusalem was destroyed by Allah. And the people of that town were expelled. The Banu Israel, the Jews. I am using the term Banu Israel and Jews synonymously. But later on we'll have to be more careful and more explicit. They were expelled, the Israelites. And for 2,000 years, they could not return to reclaim that town as their own. 
2,000 years. The strangest event which has occurred in the religious history of mankind is the return of the Jews to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own and the restoration of a state of Israel in the Holy Land. This could not have been by accident. No. You do not have an explanation. But we do. Your think tanks cannot explain. But our Quran can explain. How is it possible? Who made it possible? The answer is, when that Jewish-Christian alliance emerged in Europe and modern Western civilization was created, modern Western civilization burst upon the world, not only with an amazing, absolutely amazing scientific and technological revolution which is constantly continuing. It is not finished. And we have benefited, mankind has benefited tremendously from modern Western civilization. But that modern Western civilization emerged in the world with a power which swept aside everything that preceded it. Every civilization that came into the world before was consigned to the museum of history. Every civilization that preceded it became moribund, obsolete. And only modern Western civilization took center stage to control the entire stage of history. It is modern Western civilization which continued where a Pope, and incidentally the Popes are all European, huh? You never saw an African Pope, did you? And it is the Pope in Rome that plays a crucial role in cementing that Jewish-Christian alliance, eh? Remember that. And it's the Pope in Rome who launched the Crusades. Don't remember? Don't you remember? And launches a mysterious struggle in the name of Christianity to liberate Jerusalem. But wait a minute. Let me scratch my beard. If this is a Christian crusade, how come the only Christians engaged in the crusades are European? How come Africans are not in it? How come the Byzantine Christian Empire is not in part, a part of the crusades? How come when European crusaders passed through Byzantium, they fought and killed their own Christian brothers? How come? How come no other Christians in the world have this obsession to liberate Jerusalem? Why only Europe? That Europe which is destined to become a Jewish-Christian alliance. We say it was not a Christian crusade. We say it's a European crusade. And they continued their struggle for a thousand years. Until eventually the Jewish Christian Alliance emerges. And modern Western civilization finally succeeds in 1917 in liberating Jerusalem. And then in 1948, in creating the state of Israel, 2,000 years have passed. 
This could not have happened by accident. The Quran is explaining. This is the Gog and Magog world order, which has done it. It is the Gog and Magog world order which liberated Jerusalem. It is the Gog and Magog world order which brought the Jews back to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own. It is the Gog and Magog world order which restored the state of Israel in the Holy Land. Using this verse of the Quran. And now finally, well, why? Why is Gog and Magog doing this? What is their agenda? But you know the answer already. That Gog and Magog are working together with Dajjal, the false messiah, the antichrist. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised the Israelite people that he would send to them, not to the United States, a prophet who would be their own and who would be known as Al-Masih, the Messiah. And the Messiah would rule the world from the throne of David, Dawood alayhi salam, and therefore the state of Israel, Jerusalem. And his rule would be eternal. And the Israelite people understood that to mean that they are going to rule the world one more time. As they rule the world in the time of Solomon alayhi salam and David alayhi salam. And so the golden age is going to come back one more time. And we're going to rule the world. We'll establish our political rule over the world. We'll establish our economic rule over the world and hence the slave woman, the slave woman. We're going to establish our total complete dictatorship over the world. And when we do that, History will repeat itself. That's the way they understood it. And so the Messiah is going to come. And when he comes, he's going to rule the world from Jerusalem with a rule which will be eternal. The Quran came down to say that Jesus, the son of Mary, alayhi salam, he is the Messiah. But they rejected him. And my book, uh, which is over there, The Religion of Abraham and the State of Israel, a view from the Quran, has conducted the analysis to explain why they rejected him. Had he been a Jew, he would have been accepted. But he was an Arab. And an Arab cannot be a prophet. If Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, if we accept him to be a prophet, then the Bible is filled with lies. And we cannot accept that our Bible, our Torah, has been changed. So we reject him. He cannot be a prophet. But Allah's messenger said that when they boasted of how they killed him, crucified him, that they did not succeed in killing him, they did not succeed in crucifying him, that's the Quran. But Allah raised him. And the most important event which remains to occur in history 
is when the son of Mary returns. He was taken up into the Samawat. Samawat is plural of Sama. Don't say he was taken into heaven. Eh? Don't use that language. Heaven is Jannah. He was taken into the Samawat. Samawat is plural of Sama. Between this material universe and the command center from which Allah controls the entire creation, the Arsh, there are seven worlds of space and time. Seven. And tonight in the masjid, in Surah Al Kahf, we'll be introduced to the subject of the Samawat. So he was taken into the Samawat. The same Samawat into which Prophet Muhammad was taken on that miraculous nocturnal journey. And from the Samawat he will return one day to rule the world from Jerusalem. That's the end of history. That's where we are heading. However, amongst the ten signs there was Dajjal. And Dajjal is someone created by Allah. He's not a human being. Because all human beings will stand for judgment before Allah on judgment day. And human beings will either go to heaven or to hell. But Dajjal is not going to be judged by Allah. Wake up! Dajjal is not going to heaven or to hell. Wake up! <laughs> no! Dajjal is a special being created by Allah who will appear in the form of a human being. Can angels appear as human beings? Yes, Gabriel, alayhi salam. Can jinn appear as human beings? They got a lot of them in Washington. And so the child will appear as a human being. And his function is to seek to impersonate the true Messiah. To pretend to be the true Messiah. And in order for him to impersonate the true Messiah, he'll have to rule the world. That's where we're heading. He will have to rule the world from Jerusalem. By my calculation, he's now so close that children now at school should live to see the Jal ruling the world from Jerusalem. But we will expand on this subject in this retreat. What we have done so far is to introduce you to the reality of the world today as identified from that event in which the angel came as a human being and asked the five questions. And then we look at the evidence that was provided. The big tall buildings that you can't miss unless you're blind. And then the more difficult one, the slave woman giving birth to a mistress, which we have not as yet attempted to explain. And then we said, if this is the last age, and they are moving in that direction, you know, women who are dressed and yet naked, and women dressed like men, and men dressed like women, if they are moving in that direction, if that is mainstream, we are going in the opposite direction opposite direction. And then we ask, if this is the last stage, then where is the world heading for? What is the end of history? And then we turn to two verses of the Quran, one which allowed us to recognize the implication of the emergence of a Jewish-Christian alliance in Europe emergence of modern Western civilization, which is amazing scientific and technological revolution, 
but with an obsession, an obsession, a 1,000 year old obsession with the Holy Land, with Crusades to liberate Jerusalem. And then we went to the other verse of the Quran which shows that when Jerusalem is liberated and the Jews are brought back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own, that's Gog and Magog. And finally we ask, well, who are they working for, Gog and Magog? And the answer was, they're working in tandem with Dajjal, the false messiah who seeks to impersonate the true Messiah. And if he is to impersonate the true Messiah, he'll have to rule the world from Jerusalem. And he's now so close to that, using weapons. Number one, the weapon of money. This bogus, oh I don't have it with me, I gave it to my wife. This bogus, fraudulent, utterly haram, paper currency. But who studies international monetary economics today, other than my dear student Faiz at the back? He's a medical doctor. Faiz is a medical doctor, but Faiz is studying monetary economics as well. And where is Hasbollah? Where is Hasbollah? There is Hasbollah. From Singapore. From Singapore. I pray that Hezbollah tomorrow will be sitting here. And Faiz is from the United States. Who studies international monetary economics today? His weapon is money. With money, he seeks to control and enslave the world. He has another weapon. You'll be surprised. It's food. Food. Genetically re-engineered food. Genetically modified food. To enslave you tomorrow. And he has a third weapon. And it's woman. And so it's time for us to study the job. To be able not only to understand the world today, but the world tomorrow. We've come to the end. I had to combine two sessions in one. We now pause for Salatul Zohar and lunch and take some time to get to know each other. And we'll reconvene, inshallah, at 1.30. But if you're not ready at 1.30, we give you time. But when we reconvene, we'll have the next session in the masjid. It's going to be cool. We have the air conditioner on. And that will be the session of question and answers on this morning session. But not only question and answers, it's going to be discussions as well. So it's going to be lively. You will enjoy yourself. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.